I'd like to share with you a way to embrace a fundamental value, a value that is so powerful, it shapes the way we live our lives. This value is freedom. When I was a little girl, I was completely captivated by my grandma's wisdom. She was my expert advisor and a woman who had a prescription for everything. And I do mean everything. For success, it was go to school, get a good education, and then a good job. She said, success is really all about freedom. And so if you want to be free, you have to break the chains that bind. I followed my grandma's advice. I went to law school, passed the bar, and had this big dream of becoming the next Johnny Cochran Jr. in a skirt. <laughs> I romanticized it from getting my first job to winning my first case until it was all finally reality. Big wins, big checks, and a costume that made me feel like I had arrived. By all accounts, life was good. But eventually, eventually I realized that this big dream of mine wasn't all it was cracked up to be. It was almost like I had opened Pandora's box. And inside was 80 plus hour work weeks that left no time for my family. Anguish and disillusionment. The very experience that I thought was supposed to set me free just left me feeling constrained mentally, physically, and emotionally. And when I would share this experience with people, they laugh. They said, you must be crazy to even think about leaving the law. But I knew that if I didn't, it'd be almost impossible for me to design a life where I could be the woman and mother that I needed to be. And so it dawned on me, by serving others in a meaningful way, along with more control over my time, I could embrace the sense of freedom and purpose that I yearned for. You see, as a lawyer, I was always the middle woman between my client and the court, a proxy. But I wanted to flip the script and empower people to be their own advocates, not in the courtroom, but in the game called life. Over time, I realized that I could combine my skills in law, business, and academia to provide clients with the skills and the confidence to make a bigger impact on the world around them. And today, that's exactly what my company does. And it's been the key to my personal and professional freedom. I am so thankful for the wisdom of my grandma. So the name for someone who grabs this key and reaches for this freedom is an entrepreneur. Their journey reflects that bright light at the intersection of passion, purpose, and true grit. They are empowered to seize their destiny. And in that process, they empower others because they're not constrained by the status quo, but liberated from it. And one of the things I really love about entrepreneurs is that they're such a diverse group. There are no rules about who gets to be one and who doesn't. They come in all shapes, colors, and sizes, formally educated or not, funded or broke. And age seems to have absolutely nothing to do with it. Because Harley Jordan started his multi-million dollar marble industry at age eight. Charles Flint started IBM at 61. And Estee Lauder, Estee Lauder, at age 54. So the odds are in everyone's favor. So why isn't everyone doing it? Well, the research says that entrepreneurship isn't systematically built into our culture the way that getting an education or a job is. Oh, but it should be. Because it's not just good for the entrepreneur, it's good for society too. It provides jobs, improves communities, introduces new technology and innovation, and of course, it supports social programming through philanthropy. So no, everyone's not doing it but a lot of people do want to do it. And when people started asking me how, I knew it was important to empower others to become entrepreneurs too, if they really wanted it. So if the idea of freedom is exciting to you, along with the ability to take a little bit of risk, then entrepreneurship could be for you. But if you're risk adverse and you like consistency, it's probably not, <laughs> not for you. 
In my work, I've discovered that once someone determines they want to become an entrepreneur, there are normally three things that will stop them. When someone begins to backpedal and shrink from opportunity rather than embrace it, what we can tell is that they're afraid because fear stops people. I had this really amazing client. He was a retired judge, and together we developed this whole plan about how he would re-enter the workforce as an international consultant. Now, obviously, he was incredibly bright, had all this talent and experience, but it was really difficult for him to move forward. Now, we had to work on that, and eventually we overcame it, but the bottom line was that he was equally afraid of success as he was failure. And the whole thing, it reminded me of when my law school professor was giving my partner and I this last minute advice before trial. Right in the middle of our session, he turns, looks at me, and says, hey, are you OK? Because you look pale. <laughs> I thought this man has got to be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but what really got my attention is when he said, Karima, he said, fear is a powerful tool. He said, transform it into energy so you can reclaim your power and execute with confidence. He said, fear is like a magic bullet. It keeps you on your toes because it shows you you're in a game of high stakes, which is exactly where you want to be. And I thought, yeah, this guy's right. Fear should never be a reason for us to stop. When the stakes are high and the results are worth fighting for, our goal is to crush paralysis. And you do that by turning fear on its head and making it your ally. Now, I'm in a mastermind group. And every time we meet, there's this accountability review. If anyone has ever been in one, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's dreaded. Now, one of, the, one of the members is an engineer. She's really creative, and she's always on the cusp of a new business breakthrough. But then there's a problem, one that we all have, distractions. It's not that I don't want to be successful. It's that I have too much on my plate, is what she'd tell the group to explain her lack of results. But instead of working on her business, she'd be trolling social media, comparing herself to other entrepreneurs, or sleeping. On the weekends, she'd sleep in and then spend the rest of her time hanging out with friends. So it wasn't that she had too much on her plate, just not enough of the right things on it. And I found that distractions are equal opportunity nuisances. <laughs> they sort of create this universal pool. And if you're not careful, you can easily get sucked in. But the thing is, we all have a choice. We can anticipate and confront the kind of distractions likely to sidetrack us, or we can let them predict our fate, become the kind of person who has the best of intentions, but never anything to show for it. And that's the funny thing about free will. We've been given it to exercise it, but we don't always do so to our highest potential. Which reminds me of this. For those people who really, really want to become entrepreneurs, have you ever known someone who worked really hard, got right up to the edge, and then they realized how much was involved, and then they quit? Do you know why they did that? Right. It was too much work for them. Work ethic stops people, which is why it's really hard for an entrepreneur to be successful without true grit. What's counterintuitive, though, is that that breaking point is also that sweet spot right where you begin to see results. And so navigating this paradox is really the bane of our existence. But it's not really about working harder. It's more about working smarter. And here's why. Any successful entrepreneur will tell you that drive combined with impeccable work ethic will make a huge difference in the way you show up in the world. But being busy doesn't mean you're being productive. If you want to make a bigger impact, you have to escalate the quality of your time over quantity. A client shared an experience about one of his mentors who shaved down his workday to three hours. Now, he did that because he realized that in five or more hours every day, he was just wasting time. Think about that. How much time do we waste in a given day when we could be being productive? Here's the kicker. In those three hours, he was more productive and made more money than he ever had before. Go figure. Could you or I make a shift like that? Absolutely. So even when you don't feel like it, when you feel like you could be doing anything else, know that work ethic is really all about mindset, and mindset informs our behavior. This is why your passion as an entrepreneur must be a labor of love. You have to have a vision that is absolutely worth fighting for, because even still, 
the average person will not fight for it. But let me tell you something. There is absolutely nothing average about an entrepreneur, a maverick, who fully embraces an idea whose time has come. People say they want to become entrepreneurs because their passion inspires them. Others say they want the money, the fame, or to be their own boss. But for me and the entrepreneurs that I work with, it all boils down to freedom. And we've learned that freedom is not free. You do have to break the chains that bind if you really want it. So instead of feeling doomed to the status quo, why not take the road less traveled? Connect the dots between passion, purpose, and true grit, and then ask yourself one pivotal question. What does freedom look like to me? Thank you. Thank you.